Morning. Yeah, I was a little disappointed, Wayne. Uh, <laughs> Ah, yes, yes. <laughs> I yield my time to you. That is a timely phrase. <laughs> wow, yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, so I just returned um, from Joshua Tree National Park in California, which is a, an amazing... A wild, high desert landscape, only, you know, three hours from the heart of uh, Hollywood. <laughs> and we live in a strange, strange world and a strange time, really. And what a gift to miss most of the impeachment hearings. <laughs> um, because I don't have enough willpower <laughs> to resist the luring... Um, vortex of such a thing. And I'm not saying, you know, I'm not against, against, if you spent most of your time listening, I'm not against you. Um, but what a, I felt grateful to be closer to Earth's time and to a sense of the eternal. The desert moves very slowly. And its revelations are, um, you have to be still to contact and, or to be greeted by, we could say. And the amazing thing about the landscape in the high desert of Southern California, not just in Joshua Tree and other places, is that it's like, um, my friend always calls it um, world, it's a world within worlds within worlds. Meaning you just go over the next rise and around the next granite boulder and there's another world and almost like an entire ecosystem. And the barrel cactus and the hummingbird and the choya and, and you sort of are, are, and the quail, desert quail, and the call of the raven, and these sort of wild, uh, majestic beings, and just to walk a little further and you're in another world. It's because the entire universe is like that. It's a world within world within world that even includes our crazy culture and, um, and impeachment trials and, you know, so forth and so on, a world within world, within worlds, within worlds. So it's nice. You, you're in a kind of altered state of consciousness after a while being, I slept outside for, you know, five nights and, and under the stars and the, and the moon and the Milky Way, which you can see in Joshua Tree. Um, so yeah, you, so, so you come out of this like, and it's a bit jarring. You're like, oh my God. <laughs> and I can be a bit of like, um, sometimes I can, I'm prone toward thinking that that's the real world. And it is. <laughs> it's the real world. The natural world is the real world. And the world we're sitting in is the real world. And part of the, the terror and gift of being a human being is is the, our dawning consciousness, like, like in the reading, to become self-reflexive and to gaze, up, consciousness is to gaze upon reality and to see it, apparently unlike other creatures see it. They see the world, but they don't have exactly the same expression of consciousness that we have. And part of the terror of that is that the world is complex. And it's diverse, which is our theme for the month. Um, and it's wildly diverse. It's unbelievably so. And part of the human story is to offer our imagination to this complex, complex and diverse wild world that we find ourselves in that is both nature and culture. I mean, it's all nature on one level. I mean, if you think about it, I drove here at 80 miles an hour in a car, I know I was speeding, um, in a car mined from the earth. Really. Listening to my phone mined from, from the earth. So it's all nature on one level. 
Um, but, but part of consciousness is recognizing that there's this tension and dance between the human culture and the things that we make and the things that we imagine and the kind of world we begin to create um, and the way things are, just the wild, raw materials, that's what we call them, Although beings, we would say more majestically, that is the earth. So I want to talk about, I want to try to talk a bit about nature and, uh, and, and human imagination and diversity. And the first thing I'll just say about diversity is that another word for it is reality. I mean, people say we should live in a more diverse world. It, it already is. <laughs> you don't make it so. It is already wildly, unbelievably diverse and complex. Now, our awareness of that is what's limited. All, all, you know, I've been to a million diversity trainings because I taught high school for eight years. <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're virtually useless. Other than it brings up the word. <laughs> okay, the world is bigger than I thought. And part of what I would think of as spiritual growth, or you could just say psychological growth, is greater and greater awareness of the way things are. <laughs> and acknowledging and recognizing and turning toward and offering our attention to greater and greater levels of complexity and diversity. That means the world doesn't get simpler in a way. And that's the story of evolution. It is an unfolding of complexity and diversity. You don't go backwards. It's a continued expansion. And part of the reason why I can say that is because of the dawning of human consciousness that began to reflect upon just the way things are. So, I mean, I guess I'm getting to one of my points, which I'm supposed to wait till the end, and it's more of a question, which is, how are you offering your attention, your attention, your way of being, your thinking, your feeling, your sensing, your imagination? How are you offering attention to the wildly complex and diverse world that we find ourselves in? What kind of attention are you bringing? How many various forms of attention can you give to the wild, complex, diverse world that we find ourselves in. And since we didn't have a meditation, let's do a kind of one right now. So I, I want to invite you to close your eyes for a moment. And uh, just begin to feel yourself upon the chair you're sitting in. And where the thing you call you <laughs> meets this object. Just bringing your awareness, your attention to the place you find yourself. Maybe you can even feel a bit the mystery of gravity that is pulling you down and keeping you here and in a way holding you here. Just this mystery that we find ourselves in and that we call gravity, the name we have for it is gravity, that's keeping us on the chair and on the earth. And just allow yourself to sink into that place. I mean, how did you end up here, really? In this room, on this chair, in this body, on the earth. And, and, and here we are resting on a chair on the floor and on this particular ground in this particular place on this planet with the chiming of church bells and and the swaying of dune grass and and the way the soil is here and and now bring your attention to, to your own breath, just naturally, not trying to uh, make it do anything, just noticing the in-breath and the out-breath. Breathing in this, the air, 
the oxygen. Breathing out. Just this natural rising and falling that happens just because it happens. And the breathing in of, of the air of this place and the, and the oak trees out in the park and the white pine and the breath of the birds and the seagulls in the particular kind of air that comes off of the lake. Just you are, you are a being that is exchanging breath with the wild world all the time. Breathing in the sky, breathing out sky and cloud in a kind of exchange. And just now bringing your attention to just what you're hearing here in the quiet of this room and in this space and and human bodies shuffling and just offering your attention. Just the stillness. Yeah, and now just come on back to the room, which you never left in the first place. (laughs) Yeah, so in my view, just the act of bringing one's attention is a step toward inclusion of more and more of the way things are. (laughs) of reality, of the diverse and complex world that you find yourselves in. I bet none of you could make the chair, well, maybe one or two I know, probably could, but that you're sitting in. What a gift. You don't have to sit on the floor. Thank God half of you would not come, you know? (laughs) Like C3, they have no seats, you know? (laughs) So, yeah, um the invitation just to begin to offer your attention to the world. And how far out can that attention extend? To include the lovely things like robins, and which have left now, I would imagine, um, and birds that are still here like eagle every morning at 9 o'clock, about. An eagle comes because their nest fell down in, the, in a storm, and they come into my property that I borrow from the bank, which actually the earth owns. And then <laughs> this eagle will take twigs and fly off to wherever he or she is making their nest. So anyway, to include more and more of the world and, and, and the human world, the more than human world and the human world that we find ourselves in. It's a little easier with an eager, eagle than my actual physical neighbor of human form, (laughs) because of all of our layers of judgment and categories and signs that are put in yards that give me indications to certain ideologies, (laughs) things like that. Um, Okay, so what do I want to talk about today? Maybe a few things I'd like to mention. Um, about the human body for a few moments, because um, part of the dawning of consciousness and uh, has for, let's see, how old is consciousness? Let's imagine it's something like two million human consciousness is something like two million years old. is a guess because our earliest ancestors in some form that came down out of the trees happened about two million years ago. Uh, 
So we don't know what kind of consciousness, but let's just call it a dawning of consciousness begins to happen, and which is not very old. It sounds old. I mean, if someone gave me $2 million, I'd be like, that's a lot. But it's not 14.5 billion, which is how old the, our, whatever it is that we're living in is. <laughs> so, um, and anyway, part of the, the dawning of, of human consciousness, the facts have been stacking up in terms of really, what are we? And I was thinking about that this morning um, because your body is made up of particles, as you probably learned in the fifth grade. I didn't pay attention very much in the fifth grade, so <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just learning these things through Google. Um, but there's something like seven billion, billion, billion particles in your body. Seems like a lot. Seven billion, billion, billion. So even your relationship to your own body has both complexity and diversity, wouldn't you agree? And what part of you had any say in these seven billion, billion, billion articles? I mean, did you wake up and be like, I'm gonna add a billion? It's easy to do with American fast food. Seven billion, billion, billion. And what's amazing about it is those particles are made up of four things, or four kinds of particles, we could call them, that make up the core of who you are. You have hydrogen, and you have oxygen, you have carbon, and you have nitrogen, that are all in a kind of complex and diverse relationship with one another. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. I don't know what you would be or if you would be anything. And, and without making this up, we know this. I mean, I don't even know what to do with this information I'm about to give you. But some of those particles, particularly the hydrogen particles, started with the Big Bang. Meaning, they existed before you existed. I know some of you are like, I'm feeling old. I'd say, yeah, you're feeling old. <laughs> 14.5 billion years old. What do you do with that in terms of information? Who are you, really? How long have you been here? I, know people, I don't know if you believe in an afterlife. When I say I don't really believe in an afterlife, I mean my egoic persona probably isn't going to be walking around somewhere you know, you know, letting the dog out and, you know, playing football or something, you know? I think probably not. But the particles of my body will go on. That is a fact. And they were here before I ever, before the earth ever dreamed me up in this particular form. What else can I say about these? Particles. Oh, the other parts, the oxygen, the carbon, what's the other one? Nitrogen. Nitrogen came from the burning heart of stars. That is a fact. I sometimes wonder, in my own imagination, why human beings have a love affair with the stars. Because why not? It's, it's the very core of who we are. I mean, who do you know that, like, oh, I really hate the stars? You know, when they come out, that's so dumb. <laughs> Nobody thinks that. I think we have a kind of deep connection with the universe, with the stars, because that's what we're made of. And this is only just to speak about your particular human form. And in terms of mass, now this is kind of interesting, because you think, well, I'm a thing. I like, I have mass. I, you know, and what is that? What did you say? I'm massive? Yeah. <laughs> so what is this mass? You say, oh, it's the particles. Not really. <laughs> Most of what we call mass isn't particles at all. Now we're going to venture into a territory I know even less about, which is quantum physics. Because what we call mass is the energetic exchange between particles. Energy. 
quarks, and they have some other name like gluons. I mean, real genius made that one up. They glue things together. That's our, there's an energetic exchange happening between particles of which we barely understand, and that's what, makes, that's what gives us mass. Energetic exchange, attraction, we would say. We will say it's all about love. Actually, it is in the sense of attraction. That is the energetic force that holds you in your particular form for these particular years that you happen to be here because that's the way all things are. People say we need more diversity. I mean, we can barely even comprehend the amount of diversity that's in our own human body. And it works by law of attraction and exchange and connection. And then things get really freaky because the lines get blurred between what I call me and everything else because there are energetic exchanges happening with everything, including what we just imaginatively entered into, the exchange of breath with sky and tree and raven and seagull. And that is not made up. That's just the way it is. This swapping, energetic swapping and exchange. The problem with fundamentalism, and we might just say any form of fundamentalism, is that it keeps the world small. That's what it does. Any form. Like pick it. Christian fundamentalism, other kinds of religious fundamentalism, scientific materialistic fundamentalism, Marxist fundamentalism. It says, this is the world. (laughs) Right here. And I know about it. And other people who disagree don't know about it. It keeps the world small. It's it's a refusal to exchange with the wild, complex diversity of the way things are. It says, if I could just keep the world small, therefore contained, usually it's something like, I'd be safe. It's not a bad impulse, because I love nature, but it's not like my friend, you know? I mean, when when I was in Joshua Tree, I was laying on the earth, and I felt something like a massive thud. I thought, that's odd, because there aren't large animals. I saw no boulder fall, but I felt a large thud. And when I came out of the park, and I just happened to be looking on my uh, nature-based phone that came from minerals from the earth, uh, I saw there was an earthquake. I thought, oh, that's what it feels like. So I'm not in control. Really. You know what I'm saying? Really. I'm not in control. And my world, even though I think thoughts and read books and have ideas, you know, I'm, I'm in a kind of cosmic dance. And it's both terrifying and exhilarating at the same time to be in the wild where we find ourselves in. But fundamentalism in any variety just keeps the container small. That's what I tried to say a few weeks ago. That's what narcissism does. Same thing. It says, I am a self-contained being. I want no input from the other, like Echo. If you remember the myth, Echo was the nymph that was in love with Narcissus, and he just closed off the world. Nothing, no contact. And that leaves you very small. And we need... We need, in the 21st century, for our consciousness to expand, to include more and more, because the small world makes things dangerous. It it thrives on flight and fear and fight. Small. So diversity training (laughs) is not some politically correct thing. It has to do with how we might imagine a safer, more life-giving world, where we include more and more of the other, the sacred others of the earth and the sacred others of the human ones, both. And that requires our imagination. Imagination is something like um, the fuel for the expansion of consciousness. Everything you have ever touched that, that we could call part of human culture, from tools to the chairs to 
the music we just listened to was born with the fuel of imagination. Really, everything, for good and ill, by the way. So it's an incredibly powerful, active agent for imagining a safer, more life-giving, loving, and more connected world. But it takes something of our imagination. And one of the be beautiful things about going outside is it activates it differently than the way your Facebook feed activates your imagination. It does. Act Facebook activates your imagination by sucking up all the energy and telling you, this is what you should care about, this is what you should like, this is what you should hate, and it's a series of thumbs up and thumbs down. That's, a, that's like pretty basic. Like if you were to take, if I, was an, if, if I was an art history professor and my final exam was a thumbs up or a thumbs down, like do you like this Caravaggio painting? You know, you wouldn't pass my class. That's low-level consciousness telling you what you should like and dislike. And the wild world doesn't work that way. It, it, it expands the human heart and the soul. And you know what else expands the human heart and, and the human soul? An actual conversation with a living person, especially one that you don't know that much about. You know? It's like, God, who is this? I don't even know who I am. That's an expansive world. And we need more of that. So again, my question for today is, how do we offer our attention? How do you offer your attention to reality, which is another word for diversity? And I think we have some responsibility in this. It's not, it just doesn't happen. Sometimes it can happen by no choice of our own. Our, our sort of the scales fall from our eyes and we see differently. A lot of times it's about cultivation. Imagining that you could actually talk to someone at a party that you don't really want to be at. I mean, it's something as simple as that. Or I, Thanksgiving is like one of those times, too, now that I think about it, where <laughs> you're laughing. I haven't even said anything. I'm, I'm, not, I'm going to try to make no jokes. It's a world where it's pretty easy to say, this is the world that I call home, and I know how it works, and I know what so-and-so is like, and there's little imagination when it comes to... I mean, on a cellular level, you're a different person every seven years, completely. You're not gonna, you don't treat your, your uncle that way. <laughs> or whoever, you know what I'm saying? Like, they don't come in the door and be like, I trust you are a totally wildly unique and new person. Tell me about yourself. No, because we like the self-contained, narcissistic world. Because it seems like we can control it, but it's kind of an illusion. So what an opportunity we have in front of us this week to offer our attention to the otherness of the other, which is a phrase I used a couple weeks ago, which I like a lot. The otherness of the other. Let's see. I'm going to look at my notes to see if I said anything I wanted to say or planned on saying. Um, I did want to read a poem. And what can I say about poems? Um, the first thing I can say is, where are they in this book? Here they are. Uh, this is a poem of which I put some of it in your, in your, on your white sheet of paper there. It's by someone I know, um, Janine Marie Haugen. She's a guide at Animus Valley Institute, which is where I just was. Um, so I'm part of a guide training program that takes people outside and does these kind of psycho-spiritual things. And I have been for a few years, and it's a long program, so I'll be in it for a while. So I was at a training, and she's one of the guides. She wasn't there this week. She was doing something else, but it um, doesn't matter. She's a, she's a poet. Um, she's just a couple, two generations from uh, an indigenous people in Russia, um, Russia, Mongolia area. She's a very interesting person and um, has been a teacher of mine in this sense. To what am I offering my attention? And I want to read you this poem. And 
The reason why I didn't want to put the whole thing in the bulletin is because if you're like me and someone reads a poem, I want to see what's, what's happening. And I want to invite you to not do that. I want to invite you to hear the poem because that's what poetry was meant to, it can be read too. But originally it was a kind of song. And the question is not really what does the poem mean? I don't know what it means. I don't know if you've ever seen those interviews with Bob Dylan when they ask him what a song means. He's just like, it's ridiculous, you know. Don't talk to me. <laughs> um, so another question would be, what effect is the poem having? And the effect that a poem has is very mysterious because you're affected by the images and they also activate your own imagination and your memory and the experiences that you've had in your life. So there's a kind of exchange. It's an encounter with, this, with the otherness of the other in the form of a poem, in the form of a song, in the form of words and images. It's expansive. No one reads a poem and says, boy, I just want to remain stuck, you know, and never change, and I'm right. You know, they probably haven't encountered the radical nature in which art cracks that door open. Okay, anyway, that was my pitch for poetry. <laughs> Go poems. Um, so I'm going to read it, and maybe I'll interject a few little lines here or there, but just allow the images to do whatever they want to do, to crack open your own doors and your own windows of imagination and feeling and sensing. Later on, you can find the poem online if you want and you can dive into it deeper. And maybe that's another definition of a poem. A good poem works on you over time. You know, it's not a fact. Two plus two equals four, you're done, okay? Poem doesn't work that way. It works on you slowly over time. And the most, the, the, the strongest poems in my life work over years. And sometimes I'll read them and I'll think, I've never heard this before. That's, that's when you're dealing with, something that has some real richness. So anyway, this is a poem about imagination, about a human imagination. Um, questions for creatures with forward-seeing imagination. And the subtitle is for Thomas Berry. Thomas Berry is, uh, I've used him before, ecologist, I don't know what to call him, a dude. For billions of years, for billions, for billions of years, billions of creatures have made a home on this jeweled planet. Long time. For billions of years, billions of creatures have made a home on this jeweled planet of water and stone. Wild love affairs. Sun and earth, fungi and algae. These are the wild love affairs. Bacteria and mitochondria preceded and spawned us. How do we get here? Billions of love affairs is how we got here. Our ancestral lineage recorded in the original eyes of trilobites, in undulating muscle of jellyfish, in ancient skeletal minerals sketched first in the dark heart of stars. Oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen. So, peering backwards, peering backwards, peering billions of years backwards in time, we probe deep space and cosmogenesis meaning the way the cosmos came into being. Peering billions of years backwards in time, time, we probe deep space and cosmogenesis. Decipher the unfurling story of life, yet barely perceive the future hurtling towards us, even as it's shaped by our ambitious, grasping hands, and filled with the stuff of human imagination. We look backwards, in other words, 
trying to understand the story, even as we have a hard time imagining where we are going. A story shaped by our ambitious, grasping hands and filled with the stuff of human imagination, however impoverished or vast. This is the dawning of a kind of consciousness that realizes that human imagination has an effect on the future. Whether it's impoverished or vast. She goes on, billions of creatures, billions of creatures already know their perfect place in the cosmic dance. Cosmic dance is a phrase from Thomas Merton. Billions of creatures already know their perfect place in the cosmic dance. Like the sandhill crane. It knows its cosmic dance. It's not wondering, what the hell should I do with my life? Their specific genius expressed in relation to nectar or coral reef, sequoia or hawk. Millions of unlettered species already answer questions we have barely begun to ask. The oldest mystery school, apparent in ones who commune without cults, communicate without language, migrate without combustion or without brains or hands, couple with the sun, birthing energy from endless streaming photons. This is the wild world, doing what it does without cults or combustion or language or even hands and feet in their particular participation with the cosmic dance. <laughs> what must they think of us, she asked. What must they think of us? Hungry ghosts hooked up to plasma TV, gathering faraway food in packages, drinking from plastic bottles, raising forests for scented tissue and catalogs. What must they think of us? Slicing our own flesh for pleasure or perfection. Pouring poison into the faultless bodies of children. Loading the tender arms of young men and young women, loading the tender arms of young men and young women with bombs and guns, exploding their minds with the dismembered bodies of their own kind, which we call PTSD. Before they ever know how to wallow with a lover in wildflowers beneath the holy moon and burning eyes of the gods, before they know what genius smolders in them an awaiting fire, before they know how to pluck a columbine and offer cool nectar to the lover's tongue. What must they think of us? This is the way it's always been. Billions of creatures co-arising. This is the way it has always been. Billions of creatures co-arising. This is the way it's always been. Billions of creatures co-arising. Co-arising. In the cosmic dance. It's always been this way. Billions of creatures co-arising. Fading in and out. I mean, we just got here, human beings, fading in and out of the irreversible cosmic symphony. And here's an aside. Evolution is strange. It's irreversible. 
That's the one thing we know about it. As the world changes and unfolds, you don't go back. You don't say, let's just retool something that happened. You can't. It's an ever unfolding, co rising, what she calls the irreversible cosmic symphony. So, what you imagine, how you imagine, even your way of being in the world continues the story forward. You don't get a do over. And I might add one other aside here nature is very slow. The kind of evolution and change. She's hinting, it's very slow. In some ways, it's very conservative. That's a naughty word to some people. I mean, a bird isn't like, I'm going to try out like four or five wings this month and see which one works. You wouldn't, nothing would, it's fair, it's conservative. There's innovation and there's, and there's the, the capacity to conserve at the same time. I think that keeps us somewhat humble. Okay, she asks a question of these billions of creatures co-arising, phasing in and out, fading in and out of the irreversible cosmic symphony. Do they regret living as they must, cued to primal harmonics of tide and storm and phytoplankton and oak and lion and vole? And what of us? What of us? In the last green flash of consciousness, or if she were here, I might ask her if she means in the latest green flash of consciousness. But she says, in the last green flash of consciousness, before we are swallowed by the great sea, will we wonder if we have left a wake of ruin or of celebration? Will we wonder if we have left awake of ruin or celebration, an offering of reciprocal gratitude? An offering of reciprocal gratitude to the billowing imagination and wild cosmic womb from which we first emerged. She's inviting us to live into our full human potential, to offer a kind of reciprocal magnitude, a kind of gratitude to the billowing imagination of the cosmic womb, to be in that kind of relationship to the otherness of the other. So I'll finish. This is the final. I'll read part of it and finish the final line, and then that's all I've got to say. In the last green flash of consciousness, before we are swallowed by the great night sea, will we wonder if we have left a wake of ruin or of celebration, an offering of reciprocal magnitude to the billowing imagination and the wild cosmic womb from which we first emerged as spark, as seed, as fragile embryo of possibility. Thanks for listening.